Well, children, are you ready? Yeah, good, excellent. Kent's got it that children are of all ages. All right, so remember we talked about chores last week, if you were here. Do you remember what uh, my least favorite chore was? Taking out the garbage. Yep, Mm mm-hmm, absolutely. You know what one of my favorite chores is? No. Although, I, it, there is some real satisfaction with vacuuming. Any other guesses? <laughs> laundry. <laughs> uh, folding laundry, actually, specifically. I'm not real big on, you know, doing the laundry, but folding the laundry I find to be very satisfying. What about you guys? Do you have, have you figured out a favorite chore? Definitely not folding the laundry. There are some in my household who would say not folding the laundry as well. Yes, Izzy. Making your bed. Why do you like it so much? Because it's easy. Uh Uh-oh. Then I think there are some military personnel who would probably say you're doing it wrong. (laughs) All right, yes. Cleaning your room because it's easy. Well, then maybe you keep, you know where everything is. Okay, all right. You probably keep your room cleaner and neater and tidier than I do, it sounds like. All right, yes? You like folding laundry too? Sorry, I missed that. Oh, oh, same thing as Renzi, keeping his room clean. Do they share a room? Oh, well. (laughs) All right. Yes, okay. Also cleaning her room. Now, I should ask, uh, I should ask Cody whether their rooms are actually clean most of the time. Uh. All right, someone over here. Yes. Doing the dishes. Which part do you like, the drying or the washing? The washing, yeah. The washing's better than the drying. You know what I like about folding laundry? I like it when I can get it as close to perfectly folded as possible. I find it very satisfying. Yeah. But, you know, what's that? (laughs) Somebody wants me to come over and fold their laundry for them? Yeah. Yeah. You know what frustrates me about laundry? Girls' clothes. They're terrible. They're all weird shapes and stuff. Oh, man. You know what, though? I have been trying to learn something, children. And I think we all probably need to learn this, too. We need to learn to take joy in all the tasks that we have, all the jobs that we have. Why? Well, I'll tell you. Because when I think about my chores, I often have the problem that I think that I am doing these chores for myself. And then I get frustrated because I'm thinking, I don't care about these things. Ah, Why do I have to do them? And then I think that I am doing these things for perhaps my wife. And that is somewhat helpful sometimes, although sometimes then I just get bitter. Why does she care about these things so much? They're unimportant, I think. And that's not good. But then, hopefully, hopefully more and more, I remember that I am actually doing them for Jesus. And what did Jesus do for me, children? He died on the cross for me. If somebody loves you so much, that he would die for you, then maybe it shouldn't be making me so grumpy 
to do the garbage if I'm doing it for him. Right? If someone gives up absolutely everything for you, then surely the least you can do is do things like your daily chores with a good attitude because it's the least you can do for your Savior, Jesus Christ. What do you think, children? Do you think that's legit? Yeah, legit? Yeah? Okay, I'm seeing some nods. That's good. All right, now, children, I want to sing with you a song, and I didn't prepare the praise team for this at all, so you're off the hook. You don't have to. But I want to sing with you, Jesus Loves Me, because A, I love that song so much, and B, you know that song, and C, reminding ourselves of how much Jesus loves us can help us to love others by doing our chores too. So, uh, and please, adults in the congregation, help. <laughs> All right? So, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen. Thank you, children and adults. That was lovely. The Bible tells me so. Amen. Absolutely. We're going to look at the Bible and what the Bible tells us about work now. So, uh, people, congregation, I would invite you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. And we are going to look at verses 18 and 19. And then we are also going to look at Ephesians. We are going to look at, oh, sorry, e Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Excuse me, sorry, my, my brain. Anyways, um, so you, you need to be aware that this little section of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, but, but also many other parts of Ecclesiastes deal with riches and wealth. And, and this makes a lot of sense because we think that Solomon was the one who wrote Ecclesiastes and Solomon was ridiculously wealthy. Uh, he had so many riches he didn't know what to do with them practically. And, and so one of the things that Solomon discovers that perhaps he has a better insight into than many of us is that riches are meaningless. Riches are meaningless. And so he goes through and he talks about how meaningless riches are, how little good they do for people. In fact, how much bad they do often for people. And then he says this, this is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. The word of the Lord. We'll flip immediately to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, we'll, uh, yeah, amen to thanks to God. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. And, and this passage, we are looking, uh, you know, Paul is talking in this, in this section to various people in various types of relationships. So just before this, Paul talks with, uh, children and parents and how children need to obey their parents. And just before that, 
Uh, Paul talks uh, to wives and husbands. And, and so now, Paul is talking about uh, talking to slaves and masters. However, as you think about this, I want you not to think in terms of slaves and masters because none of you, as far as I know, are in a slave-master relationship. Instead, think about workers and employers or employers and employees or uh, you know, bosses, managers, uh, co-workers. Right? Think, think in terms of your work and your relationship to your work and to God. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is a... a a little bit like what Martin Luther talked about way back in the days of the Reformation. I, I love this, and I have maybe shared this with you before. But listen to what, <clears throat> what Martin Luther talks about. He is talking about he's talking about work. What then? Does Christian faith say to this? It opens its eyes, look upon, looks upon all these insignificant, distasteful, and despised duties in the Spirit and is aware that they are all adorned with divine approval as with the costliest gold and jewels. It says, O oh God, because I am certain that Thou hast created me as a man and hast from my body begotten this child, I also know for a certainty that it meets with Thy perfect pleasure. I confess to Thee that I am not worthy to rock the little babe or wash its diapers or to be entrusted with the care of the child and its mother? How is it that I, without any merit, have come to this distinction of being certain that I am serving thy creature and thy most precious will? Oh, how gladly will I do so, though the duties should be even more insignificant and despised, neither frost nor heat, neither drudgery nor labor will distress or dissuade me, for I am certain that it is thus pleasing in thy sight. There's Martin Luther speaking about changing his baby's diaper or caring for his wife or caring in other ways for his child. He flips these things on their heads. It's not a disgusting, despised, but necessary duty. It is instead a joyful fulfillment of God's calling in our lives. Brothers and sisters, this, this is what God called us to in terms of work right in the very beginning. You notice in the story of Genesis that we looked at before, Adam and Eve weren't sitting there, oh man, we've got to take care of the garden. Oh, I hate that stuff. Pruning, naming animals, weeding, blah. Right? No. Right? They, 
They were taking joy in it. They would even walk together with God in the garden in the cool of the evening, right? They're walking among their work, checking it out. Do any of you do that? Right? Go out and check out the work that you did or how it's going. Maybe some of you farmers, you go out in the field and just check how the crops are doing and just take a look around. I know, I know John goes out there with his camera and takes pictures and stuff. Yeah, right? Just to see how it's going. Just to see the progress of God's work and your work in the field. Or, or to walk past that piece of woodworking that you made or, or whatever and just go, you know what, that was pretty good. That was, that was something that I take joy in. Right? It, it, or to fold laundry. <laughs> and be filled with joy that not only do I get to make the corners all line up, but also I am doing something that is a tiny, small gift to God and an answering of His call in my life. Now, it was pretty cold out there this week at some points. What was, what was the coldest your thermometer measured? I think I saw a picture from the Osterhofs of minus 35? 36! Oh, that's cold! Right? Anybody got a colder temperature on their thermometer than that? That was cold. And yet Luther says, now I don't know if he's thinking about Canadian winters, I'm pretty sure not, but Luther says that frost and drudgery are not going to get in the way of his joy in fulfilling that calling in their lives. I love the picture that you posted of the barn with the with the steam rising up off of the floor. I know that somebody else was working on a shower stall this week. <laughs> was that a joy or a drudgery? It comes and goes. It depends on how it's going. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, God calls us to work. God gave us good work to do. But the good work that we get to do is not always this fun, inspiring stuff. The good work that we get to do is sometimes drying the dishes instead of washing the dishes. Sometimes it's not cleaning up our room, it's cleaning up the toy room, which is a lot harder than cleaning up our rooms. Or sometimes it is cleaning up after, you know, animals that have made a mess or children that have made a mess or sometimes it is doing the garbage or making the meal or buying the groceries and yet these are not small things in a way they are gifts Remember how the Bible says that God planned in advance good things for you to do? Well, those are not intermittent things. Those are not things that are spread out you know, here and there over the course of your life where all kinds of other mundane things fill in the gaps in between things that don't matter. Like you're just putting in time until the good thing comes. No, 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 no. Right now, you are doing, hopefully, a good thing. At least you have the opportunity to do that. You are, hopefully, listening to what God might be saying to you in this message. Right? A, a little bit later, you'll have the opportunity to do a good thing by singing along and praising God. And a little bit later, you'll have a good opportunity to re receive God's blessing upon you, which is also a good thing to do. And, and then you're going to leave this place and perhaps you'll talk with some people. And as you're leaving, you're walking. And these are good things to do, to be mobile, to be walking. You're going to go out there and you're going to talk with some people and that's a good thing for you to do. And you're going to go home and spend time with your family. You're going to drive. And that's going to be a good thing for you to do. And you're going to, you're going to 
you know, have lunch together perhaps, and that's a good thing for you to do, and you're going to go and have a nap, and that's a good thing for you to do. And all of these things, one after another after another, and, and often with many, many things happening all at once, opportunities for you to do good. And one of the opportunities that you face, that I face, that we face continually, is the opportunity to choose what we do with the things that we have to do in our hearts. Is going to the barn and doing the chores today, is that going to be a joy? Not necessarily because it's the thing that makes me happiest in the world and I'm most inspired by it, but it's going to be a joy because... I am serving God by serving these animals and my family and my business. And so it is a joy today. Now my family can tell you very clearly that this message is at least as much for me as it is for you. Because though I have been serving, as many of you have, serving God for pretty much our whole lives as far as we know, nonetheless, this is an area where I can grow very, very much. Right? I've shared with you before how sometimes I'll walk into the kitchen and I'll see the pile of dishes, which is not a big pile because they're our family is good at taking care of the dishes for the most part, but I walk in and I see a couple of cups and a bowl, and I'm like, oh no, my life is ruined. It's not yeah, it's, it, it's really that bad. I'll like, I'll like sit down on the chair and I'll go, <sighs> right? But it's a, it's a joy. It's a choice to joy. A choice to enjoy the gift and the opportunity that God has given me to serve Him and to serve my family and to take care of the gifts God has given us, the dishes in the house and so on and so forth. And the more I can shift my heart and my mind in that way, the more opportunities I will see to continue in that joy in all of the areas of my life, but also the greater my witness will be to others. If people see someone who actually constantly shows joy, not because they're faking it, because they genuinely are that kind of person, because they have been transformed by God's working in their lives, that says something huge. Gwyneth, when she was, uh, when she was teaching in Peterborough, she, was, uh, she did some on-the-job training for another fellow. So he was a new teacher, and she was an experienced teacher, and so she was teaching this fellow. And, <clears throat> and one of the things she noticed almost right away was this fellow was constantly super kind and polite. Just really kind and polite. And she pulled him aside after the first day and said to him, okay, that's not going to work. <laughs> you can't be too nice to these people. They'll see right through that and they will walk all over you and it will be a disaster. Right? More or less. I'm paraphrasing. Close enough. Right? You can correct me later. If you want the right details, talk to Quintus. Right? But then, but then she observed him some more and what she realized was that this was not some kind of act that he was putting on. This was not something manufactured. This was not something that the kids were going to see through because it was real. This is just who this person is. And we have seen him throughout his, the remainder of his life so far. <laughs> Lord willing, there will be much more. And this is just who he is. And I think everybody who meets him 
they just kind of, wow, who, who's like that? Who's that nice? But he is. Brothers and sisters, Ecclesiastes, a guy, Solomon, who is disillusioned with wealth and with pretty much everything. Everything is is full of cynicism and for him. Except that he says that taking joy in your work, enjoying the toilsome labor that you have under the sun is one of the few good things in this world. And Paul says, serve your master and serve your slave as if you were serving Christ. Serve wholeheartedly, verse 7, as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Let us, brothers and sisters, serve God in doing the garbage and the dishes and the room cleaning and the folding of laundry and the changing of diapers. And let us take joy in serving our Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much that You have indeed planned in advance good things for us to do. Not just the occasional good things separated by hours and hours and days and weeks of the mundane and the boring and the everyday and the despicable, but instead, O oh God, moment by moment by moment, constantly new opportunities to do the good, to take joy in You, to serve You wholeheartedly, and therefore serve others in Your name. Help us, O God, this week and beyond to treat with joy those opportunities we have to work and to rest, to play and to chore. Lord, help us. Help us to honor You, the One who died and rose again for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.